There is a slight change in plans uh, for this next uh, session. A, um, the professor has said that uh, he and Rudy have been having discussions and uh, it's important it's important that uh, Rudy be given a slice uh, or so of the next uh, next session to to go over what uh, they've been talking about. And so, um, without further ado, here's Rudy Fritsch. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, people ask me how did I sleep last night. Well, I slept well to start with, and I kind of woke up and didn't sleep for a while. Coming back to sleep this morning. I didn't sleep for a while. I was busy solving the world's problems. Anyway. Um, there's been a lot of talk about inflation and deflation and what does it really mean? And the talk, we all understand that inflation is not just an increase in prices. In fact, the increase in prices is caused by something else. And there's also another thing out there that is called benign inflation. It's a little bit of inflation, but that's not so bad. Hyperinflation is supposedly pretty bad. You don't hear about this in the deflation side. Deflation is a disaster no matter what. There is no hyperdeflation versus deflation. Or maybe there should be. Now the dictionary definition of inflation is a growth in the total money supply, or rather in today's terms, credit and money supply. Perhaps you can tap on versus goods. And deflation is a reduction in the total money supply credit and cash money versus goods. But so what? What does it mean? What does it matter? Well, what really matters is the GDP, the gross domestic product. If the GDP is growing nicely, the other stuff really doesn't matter. But if it starts to go down, we've got a problem. In fact, if it crashes the 40, 50 percent, we've got a major problem, a depression. So I'd like to just talk about the mechanism a little years inside, and once we understand this, it's very clear how this happens. The gross domestic product gross domestic product equals the sum of all financial transactions within one country in one year. Sum of all financial transactions. So it's transaction one plus transaction two, on, 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 on to whatever, the whole annual transaction. So every time somebody spends a dollar, it adds a year. If someone hires, someone else pays a salary, it goes in here. Very simple. GDP total of all the transactions. Now, the dictionary says inflation and deflation have to do with the total money supply. So the question is, how do we go from total money supply to GDP? For example, let's take a hypothetical country with a GDP of $10 billion, just for argument's sake. And total money supply is $1 billion. Total money supply, $1 billion, GDP, $10 billion. How do we get from one to the other? Well, here is your quantity of money. And somewhere over here is your GDP. And there's a thing called velocity of money. Somebody already said it. But what is velocity of money? It's the number of times this quantity, this total quantity, has to change hands in effect. So if there's one billion here times 10, we have 10 billion. And you can plug in a trillion, 10 trillion, or whatever you like. But this equation should hold, because it's the definition. The definition of GDP is financial transactions. And if you use this money, you have to multiply it by that. Now, this gets interesting. The quantity of money under a fiat system is controlled by the Federal Reserve or the Central Bank. They can create, print money, or extinguish money. No problem. This is well controlled. What about this one? Who or what controls the last year money? Suppose the Fed prints it, here's your billion dollars, and people start not spending for whatever reason. 
times 8, because the velocity slows down, this goes to 8. So the GDP is controlled by these two variables. There's a variable here and a variable here. Two variables that are disconnected from each other. One is controlled by the Fed, the authorities. They have a grip on it. The other one is loose, going up and down. What drives it? Psychology, anchoring expectations, uh, job holding, no control, out of control, or in people's control. So we got a problem. They can increase the quantity of money by 50%. If the velocity goes down, the GDP will not change. If the velocity goes down by 100%, or it, it halves, or whatever, GDP goes down. So here we go, velocity of money drops. The Fed is going to print like crazy, trying to balance this off. And at some point, for some reason, maybe inflation expectations change, or inflation changes. Velocity picks up, people start spending money. So think about it, velocity is zero if the money sits in your pocket. And if it changes hands, there's velocity. And the more often it changes hands, the more velocity. This doesn't work. This can't work. It is inherently unstable. Because there are two variables, only one of which is controlled. Is that OK? Everybody clear with that? Now, incidentally, Professor reminded me that the velocity of money is dismissed by the classical Austrians. They don't consider this important. Well, I think it's not only important, it's the most important thing, and it's the least talked about. I wonder why. That's my first point. The second point, I like to compare a gold standard situation versus a fiat situation. This is your fiat situation. Quantity of money is, is variable. Under a gold standard, you've got your gold here, which is quantity of money, the real money, the underlying asset. This is fixed, it's anchored. Okay? Now, under a traditional gold standard that existed in the last century, there were three components to the monetary side. The gold component, the real bills component, and the fiduciary component, which the professor defined in one of his essays. Fiduciary component being borrowed money, paper money. If you know the uh, situation, uh, gold backing was traditionally 40%. 40% of the issued currency, the, the, the bank notes, were backed by physical gold. 60% were borrowed into existence. So this is not a perfectly pure gold standard. Under an unadulterated gold standard, the fiduciary component is zero. There is no fiduciary component. There is only gold and real bills. Okay, so we put the same equation up here and we say times velocity equals GDP, right? But this is fixed. So there's only one variable. And they go, they must go in tandem, they must go together. If the velocity picks up, GDP picks up, and vice versa. Because this is fixed, there's eight years worth of gold sitting around. So where do the bills come in? Well, the way I see it, bills are the velocity of money. They are physical manifestation of the velocity. Think about it. What is a bill? It is a piece of paper that guarantees payment in 30 or sorry, 90 days or 91 days for some goods that are being transacted. It's clear. Christmas time comes. There's a lot of buying, people buy turkey and gifts and so on, velocity picks up, they spend their dollars or, or their coins, silver coins, gold coins. Bills are brought into existence by these transactions. Bills are drawn on these merchants. It's the clearing. That's Art the clearing, the clearing system. The clearing system, that's right. As the velocity or the spending increases, there's no increase in this, there's an increase in this. So again, the bills move in tandem, now we've got three things moving together, and they're all kind of locked together, naturally. And after Christmas, when the velocity slows down a little bit, these bills shrink, they disappear, again in tandem. 
So, what does this all mean? Well, first of all, there's no Federal Reserve pumping in and out. There's only one variable, which controls all this. <coughs> and who controls this? You do. I do. He does. The people do. Democratic system. No Federal Reserve, no printing money, no trying to catch up with this and that, no instability, natural feedback loop, all stable and unadulterated. Unadulterated gold standard. And I suggested to Philip that the mission statement of the Gold Standard Institute be not to resurrect the previously existing gold standard to go back to the gold standard which did have a fiduciary component, but to build an unadulterated, pure gold standard based on this and this only, giving power back to the people. And that's it. It's not a question of which country, it's a question of which commodities, because one very important thing about the real bills is that the commodity underlying the bill must be in very urgent demand by the consumers. So if you rephrase your question, which commodities are those which approximate this real bill theory ideal best, I would say crude oil and the most important foodstuffs. Because, I mean, people just have to have them to survive. And, and that's the best answer I can give you. <laughs> well, I think that's maybe it. real estate, the roof over your head. No, no, it has to be consumed. It has to be into gold in 30 days. Consumer, I didn't want. That, that, without that consumers, one. the real bill doctrine doesn't make yeah, any I sense. I don't think you're familiar with the underlying real bill. The real bill is a bill drawn on a merchant selling consumer goods because it's delivered to the merchant and he, he, he gets a clearing and he pays the bill in 90 days maximum with the gold coins. So the, the real bills mature into gold maximum 90 days. So really they are part of the gold system. They have to be. That's the only way of doing it. And you cannot draw bills against stuff that sits there for years. That's not in this consumable area. You cannot mature in 91 days. The, in the energy market, there are bills which are very, very similar the real bills. They are also short term and a lot of other features. So th this is not being discussed by mainstream economics, but I'm suggesting that the real bills doctrine is alive, well, and kicking. Yes, I guess commercial credit is the nearest we get to that, the short term credit. Yeah. Unfortunately, the banks have their thumbs in this as well. Yeah. You know. and get it. Get there. Oh, another very important uh, aspect is this. Suppose all the banks are wiped out in this financial crisis. The world will not come to an end. Because real bills will spring up spontaneously without any government, without any bank, central or otherwise. And life will go on. Just wait and see. This might be happening. In, give, give it a few years. I think this is something to watch. The spontaneous springing up of re real bill circulation. There's a quotation out there, uh, one of the Austrian economists, and I forget the name, made about, wrote about 20 years ago, and I can't remember it word by word. But he said, in effect, he said, honest money and free banking are not impossible. They're merely illegal. <laughs> Ah, 
Isn't yeah. that beautiful? <laughs> and he says, when people realize that honesty is the best policy, they will come back again, as they have done over and over and through history. Because just as fiat currency is the beginning of fraud, or they go together, so gold currency is the beginning of honesty, and they go together. Any other questions? Yeah, well, actually, a couple of clarification comments, and then a sure. question for the professor. Uh, Rudy, that's the whole reason that, uh, as the professor wrote, there was never a shortage of gold once the real bills doctrine came about, is because Absolutely. the velocity could continue to increase, yes. and that's why you have growth in the economy greater than the growth in the available yes. gold stock. Uh, I want to clarify that. And um, Professor, I guess what you're saying is that when real bills come back, we can first expect them properly to reappear in oil and other energy products and, and food, since those are the two most uh, quickly moving consumer goods. Uh, my question, I guess, was um, has any, have you read in any of your studies, were there any estimates made of the actual number of times that uh, real bills would turn over um, during, the, during that era? Because uh, I'm curious to know what the actual velocity was and what a maximum velocity might be uh, for them. I guess it's infinite, but I'm curious to know if, you, if you've ever seen any uh, records. Well, that depends. That depends on the economic conditions. In some cases, there's a high turnover. In some cases, there's a slow turnover. But it does have this built-in flexibility. It can expand. The real bill circulation can expand quantitatively and qualitatively. By qualitative expansion, we mean exactly this <coughs> velocity of circulation. So th there is no hard and fast answer to this. Uh, for just two, two, and two sorry, one second. Uh, Professor and I were talking a few minutes ago, and he says in the olden days, all these things were literally paper, and they had to be posted and transferred in relatively slow movement. Today, with instantaneous communication, this could go at the speed of light. It's so much more flexible. That's right. Yeah. And the other thing is, uh, this fluctuation in, in, in GDP and so on is relatively short term. Longer term, a benign deflation takes place. That is to say, if the, if the uh, GDP average over years is growing 3% and the money supply, the gold supply, is growing 1.5% or silver supply, you have a 1.5% reduction in all the prices. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's how, if I know I've read about that, that's what you can expect under that. You could expect yeah. model inflation. That's how the estimated or measured. And isn't that nice if you save money, it's sitting in your pocket and it's appreciating? Yeah. Instead of depreciating? Instead of Doesn't depreciating. that encourage savers, the honest people? Yeah, yeah, sure. Very quickly, Rudy, the uh, author of that uh, quote was Hans Senholz. No, Hans Senholz. Yeah, yes. very good. Well, I sent it to you in an email, but I forget. I just looked at the email. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. Okay. No, Rudy, yes, sir. given human nature, uh -huh. uh, under the real bills doctrine, aren't you transferring the ability to create money from the central banks to the producers of oil and wheat and soybeans? No. They don't produce the, the bills. The consumers produce it. That oil can sit in the warehouse forever. But if somebody buys it, then the bill is written. So it, it, the, 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 the thing goes the other way. If you don't buy, if the velocity of money is zero if it's sitting in your pocket. And of course it's never zero. It can't be zero. There'd be no economy. But it's very slow. Therefore, very few bills are drawn. So you, you, you do that. And everybody put together. Okay, so let's say I'm a consumer of oil. Yeah. I could write a bill of, of over some oil I didn't even buy. Wow, now you're talking fraud. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> we, we just had a little discussion on this. Are you familiar with the diamond face diamond market? How diamonds are transacted on a wholesale level? On a handshake? Usually it's the Jewish community. They take a sack of diamonds. Think about it. A, a fortune in a sack of diamonds. They look at it, close the bag, shake hands, and walk away and they will pay. And it's guaranteed because if they don't pay, they're basically dead. Well, they know them. They, 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 That's, they, they know them. And, this and they, the did that, they do it all this. It's not trust. You just don't have yeah, a piece of paper or something. This is very transparent. And if the bills <clears> are not rolled over, they must be paid in gold. 
and if the, the, the merchant could not sell all the merchandise he made a mistake, he's going to dig the gold up somewhere else to pay the bill. Because if he doesn't, his family and his business is blackballed for generations. I mean, he's dead as a merchant. So it's very powerful and it's self-enforcing. And that's one of my keys that this is self-enforcing. It has built-in feedback loops that keep it under control. And there's nothing hidden. All these things are open to anyone to examine. What the bill is drawn on, where it's going, where's the merchandise, the, the shipping address, the, the, the vessel it's in, the insurance policy that goes with it, everything is transparent. Okay. Rundi, before we let you go, I have a question. Sure, thank you. Supp this is, uh, not, had nothing to do with what you've said. Suppose we had that marvelous building in Vienna, the Gold Standard Institute, and we put the logo or the emblem here. What, what does it say? The, the, uh, the, the word liberty, prosperity, peace. Yeah, okay. So we put it up there. And we put the emblem up. Alright? And there's still... Yeah, so everybody can see. That's the... the motto. Motto of the gold standard incident. But we still have space there. What, what would you write there? Credit. <laughs> no, no, no. How about, in God we trust, everybody else pays much. <laughs> oh, you had a better one yesterday. Oh, the buck stops here. Okay. Thank you very much. Ruben. Thank you. That was excellent. But stops here. That's one. Is it? Okay. Well, I guess I'll go back to my camera. Well, thank you, Rudy. I think. Uh, it's, it's rare that that we benefit so much from people's sleeplessness, <laughs> and uh, and that's really why I enjoy these uh, these meetings that the professor has organized that he attended because the the people here the level of discourse and the thought that's that's comes here because what comes out of these things is is rather unexpected and it's, it's that's that's what humanity is all about. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. The title of my talk this morning is will the gold standard be released from quarantine quarantine is uh, when a ship comes to port and there's suspicion that there's contagious mm -hmm. disease <laughs> on board then the officials of the port put a quarantine put the ship and its staff <laughs> into quarantine. This means that nobody can leave the ship, nobody can enter it. They'll provide them with foods, but foodstuff and other necessities, but there is no communication. And that's what happened to the gold standard. They put it in quarantine. Usually the quarantine lasts for 40 days, something like that, that even the most uh, viril, 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 virulent uh, diseases have uh, uh, shown sign to break up and break out, and if it didn't, then they lift the quarantine and the ship can go. But the gold standard has been in quarantine for half a century and it's still there and even with this crisis we have now financial and economic there is no talk about lifting the quarantine so much so that we cannot even talk about it I mean we can here but if you try to organize something at a, an accredited university you're out of luck. They are not going to listen. 
And I am saying this because I have tried. We have a great friend in Britain by the name Adrian Buckley. He is an influential fellow. He is sitting on various boards of important companies. And he is usually invited to the shadow cabinet meetings of the Conservative Party of Britain. And he is a, a great friend and believer in our cause. So he made a suggestion to, I think, James Cameron is the name of the... David. David. Okay. That uh, they should put on the agenda of the gold standard. And, uh, they, you know, I mean, they take him seriously, but when this happened, <laughs> all the faces froze. <laughs> now, look, we are a serious party. <laughs> Don't take us for a joke. We have our plate, our plate full. We cannot go after imaginary problems. We want to spend our time and energy on real problems. So that was a non-starter. He tried the various universities because he has friends in various professorships and chairs all over the United Kingdom. It was the same thing. There was no way anybody could or would put on a discussion on the issue of the gold standard. So what's going on? Well, I'm suggesting it to you that There is a taboo. This is not an accident. It's not that there is an organized uh, resistance that there should be zero publicity given on the part of official dawn to the gold standard. Let the sleeping dog lie. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are not going to let the sleeping dog lie. We are going to provoke a discussion. And that's a tall order. We have to work very hard, but we are willing to work very hard. And I think eventually the message will be out. If you go back a little bit in history, you will realize that the gold standard was taken very, very seriously at one point. And we don't have to go further back than the period before World War I. It was taken for granted that after World War I broke out, it may not last for more than three, four months, simply because the governments will run out of money. They won't be able to finance hostilities anymore. Well, how badly they were mistaken. Because it was so easy to get rid of the gold standard under various war time measures. And that was the time when central banks came in and the financing of the war was made not only possible, but very easy. Now, there had to be some academic justification for this, because there was a very considerable literature and studies and some gold standard. And it's still available if you are willing to go to the basement of various libraries because they didn't burn those books. They're still there, but you might have to dig them out because the dust has settled there. Students have no access. Only researchers, if you 
establish your credentials, you may be allowed to look at those books, but there, the literature is there. So what happened? Well, I'm suggesting that what happened was that an adventurer by the name of John Maynard Keynes came along and he developed a theory which he presented to the governments and the central banks which said that the gold standard can be studied only through psychopathology. The gold standard is nothing but a, a bunch of superstition which is made impressive by uh, dressing it up in a scientific garb. So it looks impressive. But basically it is pathological, psychopathological. And he said that he was trying to dig deep to find the roots of man's uh, desire to hold gold. And every time he did that, he ran into the same thing. And he quotes Virgil, who in the Aeneid has this line, Auri sacra famis, which means that accursed hunger for gold. And that's the end of scientific research, because at that point, he as an economist has to throw up his hand and say, sorry, I can't push this any further. I have to pass on the case with a shudder to the psychopathologist. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not my word. To pass on the case with a shudder to the psychopathologist. This is in the published work of Keynes. It's there. These are his words. With a shudder. Well, I think with a shudder, the economists should take it back and take a second look and do a better job. Because there is, indeed, a scientific theory of the gold standard. And it's based on one of the fundamental notions of modern economics. And this is the marginal utility of commodities. This sounds a little bit forbidding, but it doesn't have to be, because all that means is that we must all recognize that our needs and desires have a diminishing nature. The more of something we get, the less desire we have for, to have an additional portion of this. This is the same with food, it's the same with books, it's the same with entertainment. There is a satiation. You like that word, satiation? Mm. Boy, <laughs> <laughs> sounds good to me. Uh, perhaps you could put it up. You know how to it. You know how to It's not a it's not an everyday word, but it's a very useful word. It means the point where you get satisfied, where your needs or desires reach the limit, saturation point. So, yeah, okay. So, marginal utility means that the more of whatever you have, the less desire you feel to get an additional portion, additional unit, but it doesn't have to be, uh, it was, doesn't have to be parcels, because some things like alcohol or liquids or wheat and so on, they are not parceled out, but 
you still have the same. So whatever the case may be, you have this diminishing uh, desire as the stock pile which you control is increasing. So it's a natural question to ask, can we compare different commodities from the point of view of declining marginal utility? In other words, obviously, if you have a perishable good, it could be a Christmas tree, it could be uh, lettuce, which would uh, spoil if you don't use it quickly. It, you reach that saturation point rather quickly. But then there are other goods which would keep uh, over time, would not start rotting so quickly, and then there are metals which are practically forever and so on. So, can we compare them? And the answer is yes, of course we can, because some will have a fast declining marginal utility where the saturation point is reached very quickly and there are others which have a slower, more slowly declining marginal utility for which the saturation point is reached rather late. So then the obvious question is what is the commodity for which the satur the, this declining marginal utility is happening at the slowest rate in comparison with others. And whether you like it or not, look at it from any point of view. If the scientific answer is, this is gold. And there's a good reason, and this is not something which could be changed on a whim, on the impulse of a whim, because as a consequence of the slowest declining marginal utility over centuries, nay, over millennia, thousands of years, maybe we can go as far back as 5,000 years, the accumulated total supply of that particular commodity became the largest in terms of annual flows. So the ratio of stock to flows is the, the largest. So ladies and gentlemen, that commodity, to make the long story short, is gold. Whether you like it or not, some people hate it, some people love it, but that has nothing to do with the issue. This is not a popularity contest. This is an historical fact. And if you want to say that, let's change it, let's change it to platinum, then that won't fly. The platinum might be scarcer, its unit price might be higher, and all that, but the fact is that platinum doesn't have that built up stock behind it, which is absolutely necessary for you to have the confidence that if all these generations before us have thought, have put their faith in the stability of the value of gold, that's a fact because all this supply is there. It's, it's a reality and so platinum doesn't have it. It might have much better qualities for various chemical purposes of this or that or that. It doesn't matter. The fact is that you have to have that large unconsumed supply, let's call it by its real name, the monetary reserves which either banks or people, but mostly it's people nowadays because banks have this own, they're interested in having gold. So that is what is behind. It's not man's accursed uh, desire for gold. It's the fact that you can trust the stability of the value of gold and that of anything else in the world. And whether it's promises or 
commodities, hard stuff, doesn't matter. Gold is the one. And you don't have to have any emotional attach to it. I know some people have it. In fact, they invented that name gold bonds, you see. Um, uh, but that has nothing to do with it. Pure reason, hard facts, economic and physical facts, dictate that that is the case. So there it is. That is the scientific. Now, Ludwig von Mises, which, who is the, the uh, according to many, and I am one of them, uh, probably the greatest economist of the 20th century, he denies that gold has a constant margin. Well, I've been saying s slowly declined, but for all practical purposes, the marginal utility of gold declines so slowly that it's practically constant. So for the sake of simplicity, let's just call it gold's constant marginal utility, one of the important, uh, in fact, the most important uh, property of gold. But Mises says that, no, that won't fly. Uh, the, con the concept of constant marginal utility is contradictory because it implies infinite demand. And infinite demand is a contradiction. It's a sense. Well, we may grant this to Mises, but he made a mistake because it is true that the obstruction to <coughs> infinite demand for any commodity is marginal utility. It's this fact that the saturation, the satiation point will be reached sooner or later. This is true, but there is one exception. The commodity with the, uh, whose marginal utility declines at the slowest rate is going to be different. It is not declining marginal utility which is the obstruction to infinite demand. It's something else. And that Mises missed. And I might say all other economists have also. And what this obstruction is, is the phenomenon of interest. You see, interest theories abound. They are dime a dozen. Some of them are not worth of serious consideration, but some of them are. I'm just mentioned two. There is the uh, marginal productivity theory of interest and there is a time preference. They are both very serious studies. Um, they have been cultivated by top-notch economists. I'm not going to n name names at this point because that's not my purpose. But, however, existing theories have missed the fact that gold has something to do with it. Because its marginal utility is either constant, but if you don't like that, then just say it's the one whose marginal utility declines at the fastest rate in comparison with everything else we have. So there it is. There it is. This is the obstruction to infinite demand for gold. Gold doesn't have infinite demand any more than wheat or water, or just name it, may have. Gold has also finite demand, but the obstruction is different. The obstruction to infinite demand is interest. Because at any level, where the interest 
hypocrite may be, there will be people who say that, okay, I'm, I give up. I give up my gold because I want that income. I need that income. And you see, we are humans, we are mortals, and we know it. And we know that we won't live forever, so we want to consume, and we need income. So no matter how much we love gold, and uh, the accursed uh, desire to have gold, we will give it up, because if we don't, we won't survive. We have to eat, we have to do this and that. So interest is the effective uh, obstruction to infinite demand. Now that is probably quite acceptable. This is not controversial. But there is another aspect of this which is just the opposite. It's true, the converse of that is also true. Namely, what happens when the rate of interest is falling and whether naturally or artificially is pushed towards zero. Well, gold will kick in because there is a point for everybody, including everybody here but in the whole world, where at one point you say, now this is no longer acceptable. This rate of interest is just too low. I cannot consider it. And if you want to register a protest, <laughs> a, a real protest, what will you do? You write to the central bank, governor of the central bank, or to the president of the United States, or no. That won't be effective. There is only, or, or, or will you start hoarding Federal Reserve notes or Euro notes? No. Because no matter how low the interest rate is, if you start hoarding paper money, piles and piles of them, then it means you accept zero interest. So you give up something which is still positive for zero. Now that's counterproductive as much as it can be. And your protest is meaningless. You are jumping from the frying pan into the fire. So gold has a role to play whether it's the interest rate is going up or going down. Gold is going to say something about it. And that's the fact. And there's nothing, when you may like it, you may dislike it, but that these are the facts of life, which you cannot change. So, I, I'm happy to say that, and I, want to say it with obligatory modesty because I am trying to break new paths in the theory of interest. Bring gold into the picture and then you have a coherent and a, a, a very attractive theory of interest. But gold has to be there. You can't just kick it out and say, oh, we have a central bank and this has all the scientific research, they have statistics, dreams, dreams of high-speed computers, infinite memory units, all that. So we don't need gold. It's wrong. There you do need gold, because gold is going to, to override all scientific research. Yeah. Uh. Are you saying or implying that the movement towards zero interest rates, which everybody is feeling that they're, the central banks are feeling that they're being forced to go to, to keep the beast alive, mm -hmm. is going to result in the return to gold? 
Um, well, it, it's already clear that the gold hoard, I mean, look at yes. the backwardation in gold in okay. December. Oh, and actually, I'm saying that there will be, uh, we haven't mentioned silver here, and I don't want to overcomplicate the issue, but I have been predicting for years that s uh, backwardation in silver will probably precede backwardation in gold, and I mean permanent. And I even gave a name to it, I called it the last contango in Washington, <laughs> which is yeah. what it is. So there it is, it's going to override. Ultimately, it's gold what will come. And I think that is it. And that you cannot divorce gold and interest. And there is no central bank or combination of central banks or governments, what have you, which can, which can change that fact. So, oh yeah, and, and, and you might ask the question, I thought that was the question you were going to ask, but it wasn't. But you, you might ask a question, well, could it be that people push interest rate down to zero? And the answer is no, because they have to eat. See, lower interest means higher saving. Zero interest means infinite saving. You are not even eating, you are you are hoarding the seed, the, the, the feed, what, what you need to survive in the form of gold. Well, nobody's going to do that, or if he does, he will die, and it doesn't matter anymore what he did. Certainly people will not commit collective suicide by hoarding gold. So it's not going to happen, naturally. It can only happen if governments and central banks artificially start pushing, that, trying to save the system that way. But gold will say, yeah. no more, that's it. You've done it, no more. And, all right, so there it is. Uh, this is how gold, if you want to build up a scientific theory of gold, this is how you want to approach it. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am suggesting it to you that this is real science. This is not superstition. It has nothing to do with psychopathology. It has to do with the fact that we are humans and we are mortals, we are going to die and we want to live our life out in a relative peace and, in, and, and reasonable comfort. And in order to have that, we'll have to husband our resources that when we are young and we have a surplus of energy and power and productivity, we do some saving quite independently what the central bank governments try to interfere and take it away from us. There is always gold we can fall back on. And when we are old, it's not social security and this and that, but it is our hardcore saving which is a certain amount of gold because at that time we have a deficit of energy, a deficit, and, and we have increased needs for not just food and security and this and that, but also health services, medicine, and what, et cetera, and we cannot trust Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, what have you. Even, even private insurance is not 100%. Sure. Look at what's happening to the insurance companies. Yeah. So, there it is. That is the hard fact. Uh, and we just have to accept it, whether we like it or not. Now, there is another way you can approach gold as a subject, uh, a, a proper subject for scientific studies. And this is the question uh, of debt. The question is, of course if there is debt, the assumption is that there is a way to liquidate debt, extinguish debt. 
that doesn't need any explanation. So it's true that one type of that can very often be used to extinguish another type of that. You know, the promise of a stable government, which has been around for several hundred years, can extinguish the that of a less stable government, which has been around only for a few decades. So that we have to readily accept. However, the question is still there. Is there an ultimate extinguisher of that. Now if you say, well, of course, the US dollar, the buck, is going to do that for you. And that, I'm sorry to say, is ignoring the fact that the writ of the US government stops at the border. They can legislate legal tender inside of the United States, or they even they can even legislate legal tender for American citizens living outside of the United States, but they will not be able to legislate legal, stand, legal tender for no. uh, people who are not under the jurisdiction of the United States government. And you can have armies and nuclear arms and navies and air force, and that's not going to change that fact. So there it is. There has to be, we have to accept this again as a fact of life. We may not like it. And you may, we may, may argue against it. But the fact is that there has to be an ultimate extinguisher of that, because if you don't have it, then that will start growing. And it, there is an accelerator, a fast breeder of that. And for many years and many decades even, you may not see it, that in the background the, that is brewing, and it's growing, and it's growing more, and so on. And there will be a point when it's already out of control. And that's the point we have reached, and that's what we are witnessing now. And you can think of the uh, derivative monster, or the, the increasing deficit of what, what is happening right now in Washington in, under this new administration, that they are throwing money at every problem. Name, name it, any problem, answer create more money and throw the money at the problem. And of course, forget about the debt behind, because after all, the debt is the debt of the government, and the government can, can uh, create, uh, no, ladies and gentlemen, government is not omnipotent any more than an individual, and the uh, if you do not allow, if the government outlaws the ultimate extinguisher of that, then this explosion is going to happen. It's just a matter of reaching the threshold, just like in a nuclear uh, uh, explosion. After that, a chain reaction sets in, and uh, in no time whatsoever, the explosion occurs. So that these are hard facts and I don't think I have to really to uh, spend too much time in convincing you that the ultimate extinguisher of that is gold. It cannot be a promise that's clear, a written promise. Even, you know, you can have a, 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 combination of governments, the most powerful military and economic, makes no difference. A uh, promise is a promise. Paper is paper, gold is gold. You know, there's, there's just no, no arguing with that. So these are the two 
directions you can approach the scientific theory behind gold. And they are not doing that. They are, do, do not allow that. And this is what the Gold Standard University Live has been trying to do. Unfortunately, we didn't have the financial backing which was promised to us. I would have never, this is just a private little thing I admit to you that I was not that foolish that I would say, okay, I'm the guy who is going to start Gold Standard University. I was promised a very serious financial backing and without that I would have not undertaken it and unfortunately this scientific backing was just a promise. <laughs> the, grand, the grand total of the support I got from that source was 22,500 Canadian dollars, which was enough to finance one meeting. Actually, it was the one in Dallas, but this is neither here nor there. But uh, I mean, I was not so naive. However, King is dead, long live the king, long live the Gold Standard Institute, which is hopefully, and I'm very confident, is going to be able to handle the problem, which I couldn't. So, I'm not saying that, that uh, my approach was uh, without mistakes, of course, but the fact is that we tried. We tried to put this question of gold and money as, on a scientific basis. And the amount of research which we have done, and I'm very grateful to various people here, um, uh, you have heard them, most of them, uh, and there are some who are not with us here, today, but I'm very grateful to them because they did a lot of research and still doing it and still contributing to it. And I hope we have a legacy. We can just uh, see how our work is going to continue. And, and the time, the timing is, is perfect. This is the best of times and this is the worst of times. How can you do justice between the best of times and the worst of times? It's the worst of times because the crisis we have, the economic and financial crisis is incredibly serious. It is far worse than the depression in the 30s. Just consider the fact that the United States government was extremely strong financially in the 1930s. And its credit was, was unshakable. There's beyond any challenge, there's no question. And uh, if you look at it today, it's the worst possible. The United States government is the greatest debtor of not just all nations, but in history it, it, it has built up that structure which has no uh, comparison to anything what has happened so far in history. And this is now exposed to an earthquake and it's just shaking and it's, it's uh, I'm unfortunately, I'm very pessimistic about this, but I leave it to you to judge for yourself. So, worst of times, that's what we have. But it's the best of times at the same time because we have this challenge. We have to save civilization. We may have a very small chance, 
but it's human to fight. You don't give up. You just fight. And that's what we are doing and that's what the Gold Standard Institute is going to do. So these are the two things. Can you easily repeat that? What was the Bangkok concept? In contrast, oh, to the, the, the US, US, US dollar. The US and the Americans have been the strongest and told us the dots is clear that we know. But what was the concept? Because now the Chinese are even referring to it, or who might, who might be good advised to dig into that deeper and really understanding the disaster. What was the Bangkok concept? I think, I think what was behind all this is that Keynes said it's a lopsided system. It's not evenly balanced. There are creditors and there are debtors. And they, it's, it's heavily favor, heavily uh, weighed in favor of the creditors. And the debtors are not properly represented. So a banker would be one, the value of which would be decided by a committee where according to the principles of democracy, the creditors have one vote and the debtors have one. So when it comes to devaluing the currency or, or the bank or, then the committee will decide. So they just have to submit to a majority vote. Creditors have one vote, debtors have one. Now this didn't go down with the United States, which had all the marbles, they had all the marbles, all the gold at that time, 1944. Europeans committed harakiri, they gave up their gold, they sent it to the United States for safekeeping, and, and that's where it stayed. <laughs> <For a while. laughs> but at that time, the United States didn't see the possibility of losing gold. And therefore they said, no, 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 the, the, the bank or this uh, democratic one uh, man, one vote is not going to work. I mean, the creditors should have a veto power. Exactly. Exactly. Now, by the way, I used to know Paul Volcker. I, I, he invited me for lunch several times in Princeton and I gave a talk in his seminar. He was, this was uh, at the time when he's cooling his heels as a visiting professor at Princeton University just before he was appointed as the uh, chairman of, uh, uh, before he was the chairman of the Fed, he was the president of the New York Fed. But that was for a short time, and after that, he became the chairman of the board of Fed. Anyhow, at that time, people didn't know. He was just out of the treasury, where he was under secretary of uh, the treasury for monetary affairs. And people didn't know that he had such a big future ahead of him. So he was cooling his heels in Princeton and he gave a course uh, on international monetary system and I volunteered to give a talk, which I did on gold and so on. So we knew each other. And this is what he told me. This is what he told me. We, we don't mind having gold in international, but gold has to behave. <laughs> we cannot have gold to dictate. In other words, forget it. Forget it that gold is the litmus test. And the, yeah. uh, you know, yes. You just have the constitutional monarch whose duty is to sign the legislation what we put to him for his signature. Yeah. He should not express even an opinion on the wisdom. Yeah. Then, yeah. then we can have gold. Yeah. Sure. sure, no problem. 
No problem. But what he didn't say was that this is cutting off all the people and keeping the power just to the handful of powerful guys, bankers, and politicians. Government. Yes. Government. Yeah. That's really, you know, in a sense, it really, and that's why I, for one, did not come to the gold table knowing that. All right? There was issues involved with finance, economics, and the role of gold that played into it. And the notion that gold was somehow central to liberty was a foreign one. But the closer I got to look at it, the closer I realized that gold was central to liberty. It's the only constraint on tyranny, which is power. And Keynes grew up at a time, he was a man of his times. Keynes, Volcker, all the rest of them grew up at a time when government was trying to manipulate this and thought we had the power to, quote, do good. And government does have, quote, the power to do good. But with all government endeavors, it's, it's human endeavors. And the, and the tendency to power ultimately corrupts the power to do good. And by giving themselves the ultimate power over any constraint, which is gold, they have given over to government the power to tyrannize. And Volcker and Keynes wanted to retain the power to government over the power of the individual. And this is really where, where I think you're, you're, you're speaking to, is that they took it away from the people. That's why your, your emphasis on the mint, mm. on the individual right to own gold, to, to dispense and sell gold, is the only countervailing power to tyranny. And they, they use this, 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 they have, they come into office with the promise to do good, and they ultimately destroy the office with their acts of tyranny. And, and, and this theory of Keynes, that gold is, can be explained only with psychopathology, is exactly what the governments wanted. They were sitting in shame. They have this disowned orphans and widows, widows and orphans they who bought gold bonds from the government with a written pledge that the principal will be returned to the bondholder according to the present standard of value of gold. And they gave the most solemn promise to and, and it's in the Bible that the government, uh, that, that, that to torment widows and orphans is one of the, I forget how many sins enumerated, which cries to heaven for punishment. It's in the Bible. It's one of, specifically, tormenting widows and orphans is a sin which cries to heaven for punishment. And these Christian governments were ignoring that. They put themselves up that we know better what is good for the people, what is good for widows and orphans. We'll give them social security, we give them promises, this and that. So, you know, Keynes was this kind of slimy theoretician who knew exactly what to give the government to get clean, get their chest, get this off the chest, the, the bad conscience. No wonder they them. gave him a lordship. Ah! <laughs> well, look at, look at that. Okay. Um, this session is uh, brought to an end. And I guess we reconvene what two thirty? Is is it the next or two thirty? Two thirty. Yeah. And um, so it's not three minutes. Oh, is it going to be three or two thirty? What do you think? Maybe it is three. I think I stand corrected. Well, it's really what does it say? Three, three to four thirty. That's the next time. Three to four thirty. That's what it is. It goes to three to four thirty. Three. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's official. Yeah. Okay. So we follow that. Three o'clock. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.